people matter to God, every single one of them. Jesus was born for people, lived for people, died for people, conquered sin and death for people. As we prepare to celebrate Easter, it's time to let people know this day is for them. This is our calling, our commission. The power of the resurrection has changed our lives, but it's not meant to stop there. The life-changing love of the cross, the unquenchable passion of the grave, the unbeatable power which rolled away the stone is meant to pierce the hearts of people. This Easter, don't keep it to yourself. Step out, reach out, speak out, and invite. Well, Easter is coming, and we really want to encourage you guys to invite, to reach out and say, hey, come with me to thrive, thrive right? Come with me to thrive. And, you know, that's the, the easiest way to invite somebody. And did you know that they found that 80% of people that come to church for the first time come because of personal invitation? It was a connection. It was a personal, it was a name. It was somebody saying, come with me, come with me. And so as Easter is coming, we are just praying as a church that we would be able to reach out and invite people. Maybe it's a next door neighbor. Maybe it's somebody on a sports team. Maybe it's a parent you know from school. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. But would you begin to pray about who you're able to invite on Easter to come with me to? There we go. See, it's really easy to say. It's really easy to say. And, you know, there's another saying kind of caught me off guard. See if I catch you off guard. It says, don't talk to your friends about God. Wait for it. Until you've talked to God about your friends. Does that make sense? And it's a piece of just saying, God, who is it in my life that I could be used to invite to church? And you start praying for that person, praying for that name, praying for that person by name, saying, God, I'm kind of scared to invite somebody to church. A little scary, a little, little strange sometimes, right? Not all of you are comfortable in that world. But you start praying about it, saying, God, will you give me the opportunity? Will you give me the, the, the place? Will, will you just let the words, when I say, come with me to thrive, that would be something that they would say, I'll think about it, right? I'll think about it. And so as Easter's coming, you want to think about who is it that you're going to invite, that you're going to bring with you and say, come with me to thrive. And Easter is going to be one service here. We're going to have all our chairs set up. We're ready to be maxed out. We're ready downstairs for uh, Thrive Kids to be able to have all the teachers downstairs, both sets of teachers. So we're, we'll be ready for whatever God brings us. We're, we're praying that we'll have a big Easter service here as we come together to worship, to center our hearts and minds on what Easter is all about. Well, the series called Broken Signposts is where we're at. If you have your program, you can open it or flip it on the back. There's a fill-in-the-blank notes section on your program. If you want to take notes about what we're talking about and be able to write some things down, you're able to do that. If you have a phone, if you have a smartphone with version of the Bible app, uh, you can pull it into Events Thrive Church, and the notes will come up on your smartphone. You'll be able to track along. I got my phone running up here. I got the clock today because this, this one, I don't want to make it go too long. Like where we're going to be talking about, I'm excited, and when I get excited, sometimes it gets longer in time, right? So we, we want to be able to stay on time here as we talk about this one. But, but again, at our church, we believe there's three major engines. The first is engaging worship, and we got to experience that this morning. Engaging worship where we're able to just center our hearts and our minds on God. We're able to, to, to close and block off the distractions, the stresses, the, the, the issues in your life. You're saying, God, I'm going to turn all that off so I can just center my heart and my mind on you. And we need that worship once a week. We need to gather together to worship in that way. The, the second engine would be biblical teaching, and that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be going into God's Word. We're going to be opening God's Word this morning, Old Testament and New Testament. And we're going to be looking at God's Word and what it has to say to us. The third thing is an engaging kids ministry. We love serving kids. We love pouring into young adults and into teenagers. And so we believe we want to put our time, our energy, and our best foot into the kids ministry so that we're able to see those kids be in a safe, loving environment where they learn about Jesus Christ. Those are our three things that we, we push towards. We want to be real, relevant, and relational. And, and this morning, before we get into the long sermon, I mean, wait, no, I have my timer. We're okay. Um, this morning, the, the three words I want you to be listening to, the first is relationships, the second is community, the third is God's Word. I want you to be listening to those three things because it, it's going to be coming from God's Word that we're going to get to take a look at how we are to engage in relationship and how God has engaged us in relationship. The first fill in the blank on your outline is this. We are hardwired for relationship. 
We are hardwired for relationship. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by being hardwired? Let me, let me do this quick test with you. That, that time in life when you made one of your worst decisions, I bet you weren't alone, were you? Think about that. Time in life when you made some of your worst decisions, were you alone or were you with somebody? You know what I'm kind of pointing at here? Like, it seems to be that, you know, well, if I wouldn't have been with that person or with that group, I, I maybe wouldn't have had that experience happen to me, right? If I wouldn't have been with those people, they, they influenced me, they, they got into my head, they, they, they took me down a wrong path, they encouraged me in the wrong direction, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Now, on the other side of that, think about this. Have others been a huge role, in, played a huge role in your life mentoring you? believing in you, speaking truth to you, helping you grow. It takes community. It takes relationships, both negative peer pressure and positive peer pressure. I also believe we're all stuck living in middle school. As adults, we're still living as middle schoolers. We're worried about who accepts us, what other people think about us, what people are saying, who's being truthful to your face, who's not being truthful. Like, we get into drama as adults. Like, I, I think we get stuck in middle school, right? And so because that's true, relationships play a huge role in how we develop, in our decisions that we make, in the thoughts that we think. We're influenced by relationships, we struggle with relationships. We get torn down with relationships. It happens, and the reason this is true is because we have been hardwired for relationships. It seems like God has placed something in us that makes us seek out connection. It makes us seek out other people. It makes us engage and talk, and life is better with friends. Have you ever seen that saying? Life's better with friends, and I think that's how God wired us to be. Now, if that's the case, don't you think the Bible should say that? Answer? Yes, I think the Bible should say that, right? If that's the case, if this is true. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, and that passage is coming that people are very familiar with, it says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's saying, I'm better, I'm stronger when I have a teammate. I'm better, I'm stronger when I have friends. Listen, when I'm connected to a group, that makes me more uh, uh, able to take attack and defend and push back against things that are happening in my life. So the question is this morning, who has your back? Who, who is your partner that has your back to defend you? Hopefully you have somebody. Hopefully you have a partner that's defending your back, that's strengthening you, that's making you stronger. You know, that, that's what we look at. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron. You guys have seen that passage. Two people can, can sharpen each other in a way we draw each other to more of our potential to be stronger, to be sharper, to be ready to go. Parents, write this one down. 1 Corinthians 15.33. You ready? You might have to say this if you have teenagers. Bad company corrupts good character, right? Bad company corrupts good character. And the Bible is speaking to this. You are built for relationship. You are hardwired for relationship. You are stronger when you have relationship with other people. Listen, that cord of three strands, when you braid a rope together, that cord, that, that rope is so much stronger. And just like you, when you have somebody who has your back, who's defending you, who's pulling for you, who's coaching you to make those better decisions versus the people who are coaching you to make the bad decisions, you're better. And so we're hardwired for relationship. That's the way God made us. And we're going to take a look at, at why. Why did God make us that way? Why are we seeking out community? I believe we seek out community because God seeks us out. You catch that? We seek out community because God seeks us out. Now, on this next slide, like I said, we're going Old Testament here, right? Old Testament. And as we look at that, I, quick question. How many of you guys have ever heard the tabernacle? Do you know what we're talking about in the Bible when it talks about the, the tabernacle, right? It's one of these words that like if, if you miss Sunday school, sometimes you come to church as an adult and you're like, I, I, I didn't have the, the um, what's that? The, there you go, the flannel graph. I'm, I'm, I'm playing charades up here, right? I, I didn't have the flannel graph experience where the teacher put the character up and told the story and moved it along and had the flannel graph Sunday school teach me about these things. Because when we, when we use the word tabernacle, it is a Bible word, right? It's coming from the Bible. It's not something we use in our culture and our language today. But in the Old Testament, God instructed the Israelites to build a tabernacle. A, a tabernacle, a way to break it down simply is that it was a, it, it was a tent, that's what it was. It was a tent. It was, it was a movable, portable tent 
that had an outer fence that went around it, and it had an inward tent that, that kept the religious items that they used in the Old Testament, the different pieces that they used for sacrifice and for worship and the Ark of the Covenant and, and all that kind of stuff. That's what was kept in the tabernacle. So, so again, hang with me here. We're, we're kind of widening your, your Bible knowledge of the Old Testament, so don't don't start to get distracted. Don't day, daydream on me yet. Here it is in Numbers 1, 50 to 53. This is where Moses is instructing Israel how this tabernacle is supposed to work. All right? So, so it's on the screen behind me. You can track along. It says, instead, appoint the Levites. So all the tribes were getting property in the promised land. All the 12 tribes, 11 of them got property. One of them got the tabernacle. They, they didn't get farm fields and land and mountains, right? They got this, this tent, right? And so he's talking to them. It says, instead, appoint the Levites to be in charge of the tabernacle of the covenant of the law over all of its furnishings and everything belonging to it. They are to carry the tabernacle and all the furnishings, and they are to take care of it and encamp around it. Whenever the tabernacle is to move, the Levites are to take it down. And whether the tabernacle is to be set up, the Levites shall do it. Anyone else who approaches it shall be put to death. The Israelites are to set up the tents by division, each of them in their own camp and under the standard. The Levites, however, are to set up their tents around the tabernacle of the covenant law so that my wrath will not fall on the Israelite community. The Levites are to be responsible for the care of the tabernacle of the covenant law. So this Old Testament is saying there, there's this, this thing called the tabernacle and it's God's presence. And if it's mishandled, if the wrong people touch it, if it's not honored and treated in a holy way, there's going to be judgment. Now, I'm talking to a lot of people that have watched movies. How many of you guys have watched Indiana Jones? Don't build your theology on movies. I'm just going to say that. Don't build your theology on movies. Because in Indiana Jones, in the quest for the holy, wait, not the holy grail, what was it? The quest, lost ark, thank you. See, I, I got too much theology from Indiana Jones. The lost ark, they find the ark of the covenant, right? And they open it up at the end of the movie. And what happens to the dude that's like standing closest to it? He melts, right? It made his face sound of wax. It was terrifying as a child. Absolutely terrifying. Don't let your kids watch that. But he melts because they're, they're mishandling the Ark of the Covenant. Well, biblically speaking, that's actually accurate. The wrong people touch it in the Old Testament. It was on a cart. An ox was pulling the cart. It hit a bump in the road. It was falling out of the cart. The guy reached his hand out, touched the Ark, and he was struck dead. He was struck dead. This place was special. It was important. It was holy. It, it, was, it, was, it was different in all of creation, right? In all of the world, it seemed that this tabernacle represented God's physical location on the planet Earth. And, and that's what's being talked about. God instructed his people to build a tabernacle. And the instructions wasn't just like human-made, didn't just come up from people. Actually, we see in the book of Hebrews, this is going to the New Testament now, they're looking back on the Old Testament. In the book of Hebrews, in, verse eight, uh, in chapter 8, verses 3 to 5, it says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there would already be priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law, and they serve at the sanctuary that is a copy of the shadows of what is in heaven. That's why Moses was warned when he was about to build a tabernacle, see to it you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. So, so this tabernacle was a, a picture of what's in heaven. This tabernacle is a picture of what's in heaven, and so we're, we're creating a physical picture of what God wanted his people to understand and know about him. He is holy. He is other than us. He is perfect. He's unapproachable by sinful people, and yet this creator God who is holy and perfect and unapproachable, he wanted to tabernacle. He wanted to be with. He was seeking out people, his people, the Israelites. He was seeking out worshipers. He was making himself available to his creation. I think we're hardwired for a relationship because God's put that there and it should draw us towards him. But sometimes our draw for relationship draws us away from him. It draws us to other things. We're seeking out meaning and purpose somewhere else and in a bad relationship, in a wrong relationship. In the end of that passage in Hebrews, it's a shadow of what's in heaven. I mean, that, that intrigues me because we don't know what heaven's like. We don't know what is, all we see is what the Bible tells us about heaven. And it's saying that there's something up there that's going to reflect this tabernacle that's down here on earth. So that's Old Testament. Now let's jump to Jesus. Let's jump to Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus was God's representation 
who dwelled with us. That's the next fill in the blank. He was Jesus' God's representation who dwelled with us. That word dwelled is being used in, for, in John chapter 1, verse 14. And in John 1, 14, we've been talking about this verse in this series, Signpost. It says this, that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and of truth. The, the word dwelling in the Greek, we, we don't get to see it. We see the English translation of it. But the word dwelling in the Greek, when it was written in its original language, it was eskenosin. Eskenosin. I know you guys all speak Koine Greek. It's a dead language. It's not spoken anymore. It's what the New Testament was written in. But that word translated is actually tabernacle. It's actually tabernacle. That Jesus made his tabernacle, his dwelling, his presence among us. So God in the Old Testament gave Israel a tabernacle. And that tabernacle is, is where they would worship him and make sacrifices to him. And, and it's where the holy items were. And they taught this reverence and this fear and this approach. And so much so in the Old Testament that there, as Israel was traveling in the wilderness, they got lost for 40 years. Maybe you guys have been lost for a while, but probably not 40 years. <laughs> but for 40 years, the travel, the trip should have taken them two weeks from point A to point B. But it took them 40 years to get from point A to point B, the promised land, from Egypt to Israel. And the reason they were going in circles for 40 years is they were waiting for a generation to die off. This generation that doubted God. This generation that didn't believe God's promises. This generation that didn't think he was capable of doing what he said he could do. They were afraid to listen. They were afraid to obey. And in turn, God said, fine, you don't get to go to the promised land. We'll wait for 40 years until all the generation that doubted, that didn't believe, we're going to wait for them to die off. Israel knew when it was time to move because there was a pillar of a cloud above the tabernacle, and it represented God's presence. In the daytime, there's a big cloud there, right? Maybe like Three Mile Island. Remember the big cloud that comes up from Three Mile Island, right? Just, anyway, it's not, it's, it's not dangerous anymore. We're okay. But, but at nighttime, it was a pillar of fire. Daytime, it was a pillar of a cloud, and they just knew God was here. They knew God was with us. They knew that his presence was there, that they were where they needed to go. Can you imagine at night, your kids wake up with a bad dream, and you wake up, and you're like, okay, hey, look out in the tent. You see that big pillar of fire? Yeah, I see the big, that means God's with us. Okay, go back to sleep now. <laughs> Wouldn't that work as a parent? Like, what are you afraid of? God's with us. Where, are we where we're supposed to be? I know we are, because I see the pillar. Is the pillar moving? Now it's time for us to move. Is the pillar stopping? Now it's time for us to stop. Is fire at night? It's a cloud during the day. It was visible. You could see it. You knew it was there. I mean, how many of you guys would, would like that in life? Like, God, I just want you to appear as a pillar, and I'll just go where you want me to go. And, and I'll move when you tell me to move. And I'll set up camp, and I'll wait till I take the next step. That's what Israel had in the Old Testament. And God provided them food. He provided them quail to eat like meat he provided them water he protected them he took care of them and yet they still sinned against god they still disobeyed god they still had a broken relationship with god new testament now jesus that word tabernacle is being used and it's saying jesus was the localized presence of god on earth that's who jesus was he wasn't a pillar of a cloud he wasn't a pillar of fire at night he was a human being he was a human being who made his dwelling among us he came to show us God, to make it visible, to show us what God wanted us to know. Jesus was the replacement of the ancient tabernacle. His body is now the physical location of the divine presence. Another church word, incarnation, flesh put on. God is spirit. We can't see spirit. We can't touch spirit. We can't know what spirit is. But when you put flesh on spirit, 100% God and 100% man, that's who Jesus was. And he came to provide for us a tabernacle, a dwelling, a connection, the ability to know who God was and what God wanted from us. We're hardwired for relationship. We seek it out. So Jesus came to show us what God wanted us to see. He came to show us, and here it is in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, is talking more about that. It says, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator to, to superior to the old one. Since with the new covenant is established, but on better promises. So this passage in Hebrews, again, it's looking to the Old Testament. We're not Israelites, and we're not Jewish, and this most of us aren't. I'm not. Maybe you are Jewish and you have some background, but this is like countercultural to us. 
This is like cross-cultural. We're trying to understand the priest and the sacrifice and the process and the law and all that. Like it's, it's all new, but he's saying Jesus was superior. Jesus was better. Jesus is actually the one that we're looking for to come and to fulfill what the Old Testament was pointing to. The Old Testament was pointing to a process that was broken. We're going to see why it was broken here. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 to 28, it says, Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of his people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all of their weaknesses. But the, the oath which comes after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. So it was saying Jesus was the, the true tabernacle. He was the one that truly pointed us to God. He was the one that took away this, this process of where the priests would have to offer sacrifices again and again and again for the sins of the people and for their own sins. Because at Thrive Church, we say we're imperfect people being changed by God. Jesus was perfect. And he made one sacrifice, that's himself, on the cross. And he made that one sacrifice on the cross to atone for, to pay for, to cover, to blot out all of our sin. All of our sin, he was the one that, that created the relationship, the connection, the community with God. So God chose to use Jesus. God chose to reveal himself so we can have a relationship with him. It wasn't an Old Testament tent that traveled around. They set up and they tore down and they moved it. It wasn't this, this dusty desert scenario. It, it was Jesus. It was a person. He was alive. He was real. He spoke to people. They wrote down what he said. They listened to his teaching. They saw his miracles. They, they, they passed it on word of mouth. They wrote down so people could read it and know what Jesus said and what he meant and what, how we're supposed to live. He, he created the opportunity for us to have relationship with him. For us to have community with him. The challenging piece of this, right? In Exodus, I told the story about how they would move when the cloud moved. And they would stop when the cloud stopped. That comes from Exodus 13, 20 to 22. The, the New Testament version of knowing what they're supposed to do, it's told in a little bit different way. It's told in a little bit different way. It's, it's told in John 10, uh, 24 to 30. And it talks about how Jesus is the shepherd. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I'll lay down my life for my sheep. And in fact, my sheep know me. They listen to me. They hear my voice. Jesus was using the illustration that culture would have understood that the sheep heard the shepherd's voice and they came to the shepherd's voice. Now, I don't have sheep, but I have a dog. And when I shout, my dog does what? Bark. Nothing. Just looks at me. <laughs> what do you want? What do you, no, I'm just kidding, right? Now, my dog hears my voice, right? He's getting older. He's getting harder hearing. We have to, like, shout and clap our hands and yell at him to get his attention. But, but when he hears us, he responds to us because he knows us. Now, have you ever house sat for somebody? They give you the key or the passcode and you get into the house and you're supposed to take care of their pets. Have you ever house sat for somebody? And you walk in and the cat has his paw on 911 ready to call, like there's somebody breaking into the house. I don't know you. And you're trying to call the cat out from underneath the bed. You're trying to feed the cat and clean the litter box. And you're trying to help take care of maybe it's their dog. And like you don't know the process the dog goes for with his walk and where his leash is and the collar. And like the dog's like, who is this person? I don't know you. Why, why are you taking me away from my house? I don't want to go, right? It's kind of that, that idea the sheep knew the shepherd. And the sheep responded and followed the shepherd. And the, and the sheep heard the shepherd's voice. Now, I grew up on a dairy farm, and I'll tell you, when you chase cows, you chase cows from behind the cow. You push the cow forward. You make the cow go where it needs to go. If I stood in a field and I said, come here, cow, it would never come. It would never move. It would never follow those directions. Cows don't respond to the voice, but the sheep would follow the shepherd. The shepherd would walk on ahead. And the shepherd would look back and say, all right, let's go this way. Let's go this way. Come on. And maybe they had all the sheep's names down, and they called them Dancer and Blitzen and Dan and all. They would call the sheep by name, and the sheep would follow and go where the shepherd was going. Jesus was the tabernacle. He, he was the offering. He was the sacrifice. And in turn, he's saying, listen, the people that know me, follow me. The people that believe in me, trust me, and they obey me. Let me read the passage here in John chapter 10, verses 24 to 30. It says, The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you didn't believe. 
The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. God that built a tabernacle to show Israel who he was is one with Jesus who came to earth with flesh on to show us who God is. He points us to relationship. He points us to community. He points us to connection that you should follow me. You should trust me. You should, you should be connected to me. And yet just like Israel struggled, we struggle today. What do I mean by that? Israel struggled to trust God. Israel struggled to follow God. Israel struggled with grumbling and complaining and murmuring. They doubted. They, they didn't obey. They, didn't, they, they rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. They publicly had a, a revolt against God at one point, and they created a golden calf, and they started worshiping an idol. Like, Israel, why are you doing that? Well, the question goes to us as a church today. Church, why are you doing that? Why aren't you following the shepherd's voice? Why aren't you following when he calls? Why aren't you behind him hearing his voice? They know my voice and they follow where I go. Community, relationship, connection to God looks like one that has obedience to God, who is following God, who's where God wants him to be. There's a passage in Hebrews that points back to the Old Testament. And it says this, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. Guys, church, thrive. I, I got to say this this morning. Are you following the voice of the shepherd? Or is your hardness of heart keeping you from obeying? Are you walking the way Jesus calls you to walk? Or have you found a different path that you think is working for you? Guys, when we live in disobedience, that's a broken relationship, that's broken community with God, our creator. You can live in disobedience. God, God lets you live in disobedience, but you also experience the hard struggles in life that he would have protected you from if you would have been following him. You hear people share stories and they talk about scars and bad decisions and, and pain and, and struggles in their life. Like, man, if only I would have followed the way God wants me to follow. I wouldn't have had that experience. God was trying to protect me. He was trying to keep me safe. He was trying to, to, to care for me, but I thought I knew what I wanted. I hardened my heart. I didn't hear his voice. I was ignoring his voice. I was blocking it out. And I broke relationship. I broke community. I wasn't following. And there's consequences for it. There are consequences for sin, both now and eternity, both now and eternity. If we confess our sin, God forgives us, and we turn and we follow him and we follow his voice and he leads us, and we have community and relationship with the God that created us. But that sin can block that. It can end that. It can, it can take us over, and the hardness of heart takes us down paths that we should never have gone down. And we're just going to talk a little bit more about that. The worship team is going to come up. And, you know, we're sitting here and we're talking, about, we're talking about our faith in Jesus. And the problem is a lot of people say, yeah, I prayed a prayer when I was 5 or 10 or 15. Or my grandma prayed with me or my grandpa was real religious or my mom or my dad. And, like, we, we talk about what it was then, but what is it now? But what is it now? And, and as a pastor, I read some articles that are challenging they did a survey, and they found that 26 million Americans have stopped reading their Bible since COVID. 26 million Americans have stopped reading their Bible since COVID. It's like, well, okay, they're American, but are they Christians? And the answer was, yeah, they attended church regularly. COVID hit, they stopped attending church, and when they stopped attending church, the community broke, the relationship broke, and they stopped reading God's Word. If, if you want to hear Jesus, read your Bible. If you want to follow God, do what the Bible says. Surrender to him and say, I'm going to follow, I'm going to read. And the reality was before COVID, 2014, there were 45% of evangelicals, people that attended church regularly, that said, I never read my Bible. I never read my Bible. 45% in this room never read my Bible. 35% said, I read my Bible once a week. Once a week, it's almost a 50-50 split. But since COVID hit and, and, and there's a breakdown, there's a disconnect, and there's people that, that aren't reading God's word. 
They aren't hearing God's word. They don't know where to go. They're confused. They're lost. They're trying to do this on their own. Their hardness of heart is causing them to, to not turn to God. That broken relationship is there. And, and in Hebrews, it says, don't harden your hearts as the Israelites did. Be receptive, hear, respond, connect. Guys, when we're living our lives outside of God's word, and, and you know if you're doing that, you know if you are breaking God's instructions, saying, I don't need to do that. I don't need to handle my life that way. I don't need to live that way. That means you're living outside of God's will. God's calling you back. He's calling you back. He wants to heal that broken relationship. He wants you to heal that broken, that broken community that you're missing out, not having with him. And, and this morning, we're just going to have opportunity. There's going to be two more songs. And, and I just want to encourage you that if you're sitting here, you're like, man, my heart is being crushed right now. Holy Spirit is just, is just really beating me up right now because I have hardened my heart. I haven't been reading my Bible. I haven't been in community with God. I have been doing my own thing. I have been wandering and, and I'm out there looking for my own way and my own path. If, if that's you this morning, today's a chance where you can be honest with God in prayer and say, God, I surrender that. I'm asking you to, to change that in my heart. I'm confessing that I was wrong and you were right. We have people who are ready to pray with you this morning. There's going to be two people in the front. There's going to be two people in the back. And if, if you're looking for a chance just to say, I need to pray with somebody about this right now. I, I don't want to go another day ignoring God. I don't want to go another day hardening my heart. I, I don't want that to happen in my life. And during these two songs, is a chance for you just to respond. We're going to stand to sing. And you can just slide to the back. You can slide to the front. But you can pray with somebody this morning who will help you just confess to God, I want that back. I want the soft heart back. I want a spirit that draws me towards God. I surrender it. I confess that I've been sinning on my own. And so that opportunity is there for you to respond in that way. As we stand to sing, the ushers are going to pass buckets. You can put your connection cards. If you've made a decision today, mark that off on your connection card. We'll follow up with you this week, and we'll talk more about that. But the connection cards can go in. The pens can go in. If you've come prepared to give this morning, you can put that in the offering um, as well in the buckets. But these next two songs are just chance for you to let God work on your heart. To be honest to him, to respond. If, if God's leading you to respond, respond today. Don't push it off another week. Don't ignore him another week. Don't let your heart stay hard. Say, God, break my heart open so it's not hard anymore, so it's soft. Respond today. Let the Spirit lead and see where he leads you as a shepherd that loves you, cares for you, and gave his life in your place.